This episode is brought to you in partnership with the American College of Physicians. Listeners can get CME and mock credit by going to acponline.org forward slash curbsiders to claim your CME and mock credit. Coincidentally, this episode is on POCUS, also known as Point of Care Ultrasound, and the ACP just released a statement in support of the use of Point of Care Ultrasound in internal medicine. They plan to help establish clinical guidelines for the appropriate use of POCUS by internal medicine physicians, also how to develop educational curriculums surrounding POCUS, and they will be collaborating with some of the other societies like the Society of General Internal Medicine to do this. I can tell you that after our discussion with our wonderful guest, Dr. Renee Diverstal, I am really excited to start learning more about the use of of point-of-care ultrasound and how it can help my practice and my teaching at the bedside. Is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. And the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity. Aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to serve. We should always do our homework and let us know the world. Okay, uh, this is this is Dr. Matthew Watto. You'll get you'll get later on why they're calling me Mike right now, and this is Mark this Ray. is another episode of the Curbsiders. This episode is is a is episode brought to you in partnership. It's <laughs> this episode is brought to you in partnership with the American College of Physicians, and uh, with me tonight, two co-hosts, Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. Stuart, that's right. It's it's S for Stuart. <laughs> And Dr. Christopher Chu. Chris, thanks for joining us. It's me. <laughs> uh, Stuart, since Paul's not here, would you kindly tell the audience what this show is about? Yeah, I'll, I'll try my best Paul impression. It's the Curb Sires, the internal medicine podcast that uses expert interviews oh. to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. That's That sounds more like... I don't know. It sounds like a kidney. Like, <laughs> that sounds like it sounds like Buffalo Bill from uh, <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> okay, Chris, can you tell can you tell the audience what this episode is about? So this last weekend, I was invited to participate in a wonderful course um, where our guest today was the program director. Um, the course was a point of care and general medicine ultrasound course in collaboration with the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, AIUM, and co-sponsored by the ACP. It was held in Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Over the last, over those two days, I participated in lectures and hands-on practical experiences of using point-of-care ultrasound, also known as POCUS for those in the know. I learned how to use ultrasound I learned that ultrasound could really revolutionize the practice of medicine and enhance the physical exam skills of the internist in both inpatient and outpatient settings. And so that's what makes me really excited to um, bring our guest today to talk about um, our topic, which is POCUS. All right. We got a little hocus pocus for you just so. No, but we're not ready for that yet. (laughs) We're not ready for the pun. Oh. Okay. Uh, Dr. Renee Diverstal is an associate professor of medicine with clinical roles as academic hospitalist and as a pre-op clinic doctor at Oregon Health and Sciences University, OHSU, where she also attended medical school. Renee's ultrasound obsession started near the end of her internal medicine residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, which she will talk about on the show, and it has continued to grow since that time uh, when she came to back to OHSU in 2012. As the director of the OHSU Point of Care Ultrasound, Renee works in ultrasound education across the medical education spectrum from MD to NP to PA students to residents, fellows, and faculty from OHSU and abroad. As of July 2016, Renee has been responsible for directing the General Internal Medicine Ultrasound Fellowship, which is the first of its kind on the West Coast. She is active nationally as a member of the American College of Physicians Clinical Skills Committee and also serves on the Board of Governors for American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine. She has been involved in ACP POCUS pre-course for several years and will be co-directing with Dr. Oh boy, I didn't. I was not told how to pronounce these names, so I apologize in advance, (laughs) with Dr. Blivas and Dr. Boniface in Philly 
in Philly in 2019 and uh, hint, hint to the ACP, the curb, curbsiders hope to uh, um, attend that pre-course. We're Good. crashing it, guys. That's right. I thought this uh, interview with Dr. Diverstal was fantastic. And I would have to say, I mean, if we were ever going to have, Chris, a chief of uh, ultrasound medicine at, at uh, of the General Internal Medicine Fellowship at Cashlack Memorial, I don't know who better than Dr. Diverstal to, uh, to lead it. So we'll see. If, fully nominating her. <laughs> we'll see if she accepts. So without further ado, here is our talk with Renee Diverstal. About Pocus. Not to be confused with Hocus Pocus. That's a 1993 film that stars Bette Midler, Kathy Najimy, and Sarah Jessica, Jessica Parker. It's about witches. However, some people who start using uh, Pocus, they may be called witches because it's magical. <laughs> that was great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm 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 sure Paul's glad he wasn't here for that. <laughs> <laughs> With us tonight is Dr. Renee Diverstal, and I'm pretty sure I pronounced that right. Renee, did I Ooh. do a good good job there? You got it. Knocked it out of the park. We we've been planning this for a while now. We're really excited to have you join us on the podcast. And Chris, uh, Chris just spent a bunch of time up at your course, which he said was awesome. Yeah, it was really it was really great. I highly encourage other people to check it out. Maybe twice a year now? Twice a year. Uh, that I mean, I'd love to do it more, but it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of time. <laughs> but definitely there's other courses out there like the ACP pre-course, for instance. Yes. Well, the the ACP is uh, has kind of put us up to this talk, and I, I'm glad they did because – I I'm I want you to convince us in the audience that how important this topic is and the, the like kind of its place in internal medicine moving forward. But first, uh, why don't you tell the audience a one-liner about yourself? Okay, so I thought long and hard about this. I'm a bit of a nerd, as you may or may not have picked up. I love that you all are self-professed nerds as well, at least at least some of you. And so um, I took notes. I have papers. You can feel free to clip all this out. But um, so, but I want to. I don't want to be like that med student that that reads the one liner off the page, right? So I'm going to try. I'm going to try to freestyle this. But I would describe myself as a 38 year old female educator and physician with a penchant for obsessively working on whatever the project du jour is. A very tolerant of that husband and cat, and some really random non academic interests, including. Fantasy football. I was the hospital league winner last year with which I bought a, oh, I shouldn't say the brand name, a really nice purse. Um, uh, cooking, just food in general, and also ridiculous Will Ferrell movies. And my husband did convince me not to alienate myself to your audience by throwing in a quote here. So I locked it down. But if you guys want to throw in a pun, we're good. I like puns. I am really <laughs> concerned about the puns with a topic called Pocus. I can only imagine what Stuart has in store for us. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Maybe some magic. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen. So since uh, Paul's not here. Yeah, yeah. Stuart, yeah, why don't you I'll ask, ask a question? So, yeah, so, so my question is very, very specific. So um, what book do you think that Paul needs to read? Okay, well, that's that's a tough one. So... My sister-in-law just loaned me this book that she read when we were on vacation in Palm Springs, just having a nice disconnect. And uh, she kept laughing out loud in the middle of the pool, just just laughing. And so uh, it's called Let's Pretend This Never Happened. And there's a lot of a lot of, you know, profanity and sarcasm and all kinds of great stuff. But it's ridiculously funny. And, and also the, the author is a, a blogger. She goes by the blog S and um, she's just incredibly funny and talks about her own anxiety and all of those things and how they feed into her relationships. And it's something that I just relate to a lot. Okay. Is it the one with a mouse on the front? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's it. All right. Paul can expect to receive this in two days. <laughs> if he doesn't, if he doesn't laugh out loud in front of other people, I will consider myself a failure as a human being. I said. Full disclosure, I have no clue where he lives. <laughs> I heard I, I heard Paul has a vacation coming up in the near future, so I think he'll really I think he should get that for his vacation. Paul, we're planning it out for you if 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 he listens to this. He claims he doesn't listen to the show. Uh Chris, did you did you have a question you wanted to ask? 
<laughs> yeah, you know, when I come on, sometimes I have my um, my special type questions, which are these sort of dichotomy questions. So they're either or. Yeah. So I'll give you an either or, like one thing or another. So there's no right answer, although I will probably tell you if there's a right answer or not. And you just Plenty tell me wrong answers. <laughs> just tell me which one you prefer, and um, you can decide to explain it or you can decide not to explain it. All right, so they're pretty quick. All right, I, I stole this from Kevin Pollack from his chat show uh, podcast. So, I am Pocus or Ford, Ford Focus? Oh, I mean, 100% I am Pocus. There's, you could actually say almost anything other than maybe food or wine, and I would pick I am Pocus. Those two I'm not giving up, but definitely not Ford Focus over I am Pocus. No way. Nothing against Ford. I just love I am Pocus that much. All right, that was the correct answer. Um, <laughs> Morrison's pouch or pouch of Douglas? Ooh, um, Morrison's pouch because I don't do, uh, you know, I just, I forgot all of that pelvic floor anatomy. I'm sorry. I did have to relearn it though with, with ultrasound. That's the best part as a clinician. You go back and you have to learn those things you forgot from med school, but still Morrison's pouch with one R not to. I, I just learned that this weekend. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, a line or B line? Well, I like finding pathology, so I'll say B-lines. Excellent. And then maybe the hardest one, phased array or curvilinear? Curvilinear, 100%, because it is amazing for long abdomen. I could, If I had to, I could get a subcostal with it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm getting the minutia too much, but um, <laughs> there's only – I still think I could make do. For the lungs, definitely curvilinear. Great. This is just a taste for our listeners when they get when they totally get full throttle into to uh, yeah. ultrasound. They'll learn all this stuff. So, come back to me when this makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, any more? Otherwise, I had another question. Uh, I, I think Renee was interested in in one question. I know. Yeah, that's that. I think that's the one I wanted to ask. So this is our n- newer question that we've been asking people. I I stole this. I also stole this from a podcast. This uh, was on the Tim Ferriss show. Ask a lot. Can you name a time that you failed at something and or struggled with something and, and what you learned from that failure or struggle? Yeah, absolutely. And so I asked for this question because I heard um, at Kidney Boy talk about, you know, answer that in a very poignant patient based story. For me, I think um, I thought long and hard about what it would be because there's so many different things you could have done better or differently in your life. But for me, it was not uh, either recognizing or being too proud to ask for help when I really needed it. And that was in in residency, just a lot of, I'm not going to go into all the sordid family illness details, but I was across the country from my dad who's getting readmitted all the time. Um, Also, uh, well, I said I wasn't going to go into the sordid details. So um, just a lot of, you know, and you're working a million hours, right? You're just working your butt off. And I reached, I let myself get to the point that I felt that I had nothing left in me to give to myself or anyone else, including my patients, which when you go through all the burnout scales and everything is the big thing, the depersonalization. And so um, in hindsight, I mean, I had an amazing program director who like looked into your soul when he said, how are you doing in your check-in? And I started bawling and he, he sent me to the chief of psychiatry, not because he thought, I mean, well, because he cared and he was like, I'm, I'm worried about this. And I think the, the single biggest lesson that I took away was he said, you know, we all think of relaxation or, or filling your tank, your, your energy tank, your gas tank. We all think of those things as what's in the media, right? That like beautiful coral blue beach or that massage or, um, you know, just getting to disconnect from technology out in the nature. That's what we all think about as our, um, our only ways to fill the tank. And, and we fill the tank every day when you learn something new, when you smile at somebody, when you get to help a patient, not as a doctor, but as a human being, or when you have a really beautiful day here in Oregon where it's gray and rainy half the winter, um, those things all stopping and saying, you know, I'm filling my tank right now. That sounds ridiculous, but being cognizant of it um, is something that changed my entire perspective and having gone through burnout, anxiety, depression, all those things. It's something that stuck with me and sorry, this is a longer answer than I know is ideal, but I think we do a lot of talk about 
well, we should normalize these things. Why is there so much stigma surrounding anxiety, depression, burnout? And it's because nobody that's in a position higher above us will ever say that they had those things or that like an SSRI is literally all that got me through, you know, med school and my residency. Like no one will say those things. So I'm a newly promoted associate professor and I'm here to say that um, I think that we should all talk and model our own anxiety and securities issues. So that was my non pocus piece that I wanted to get across to your learners. So it's okay. Fill your tank. And that's like the point of why we ask these questions at the beginning, because these, these are things that we, we agree should be talked about in terms of wellness. And um, I, I think that's such a great message. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I, I really like the idea of just like sort of filling the tank and like sort of recognizing small things in your day that yeah. like help you fill the tank because it's, yes. it's uh like multiple small, we talked about multiple small feedings with someone recently. And that's, mm-hmm. I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, and, and always, I always think also what helps me out is having uh, something that I'm looking forward to at all times. Like even if it's mm-hmm. six months away or if it's, you know, a week away or whatever it is, you should always have something to look forward to. It just helps drag you through like the tough, the tough times that you're talking about. So yeah, ab- absolutely. All those things. Yeah. Well, we, we move on. Yeah, we can move on. Uh, does anybody Ready to get fired up now? Yeah, I do, I do want to get fired up. Uh, Renee, it's your first time on the podcast. Did you have any kind of pick of the week? Be, I mean, you already gave us a book recommendation, but if you had any pick of the week or anything, Now's the time, and Chris and uh, Chris and Paul, Chris and Stewart. I'm not Paul. <laughs> Why isn't Paul here? Uh, we need yeah. him. We need Where's him. Pete him? <laughs> if anybody has a pick of the week, otherwise we could just go on and and start talking about Pocus. I'm excited about talking about Pocus. All right, let's let's get us started, okay. then, Chris. All right, let's focus. All right, it's <laughs> <laughs> good. It's good. Um, all right. So before we get started, I just want to remind the listeners, to, I just want the listeners to understand that the point of today's episode is not to necessarily teach you everything about ultrasound or even like teach a specific technique, but we wanted to sort of discuss the importance of POCUS in ultrasound and the a variety of ways in which it can be used by an internist. Hopefully this will become a, a long-term series where we can really dive into a lot of the nitty gritty ultrasound techniques and procedures. But um, lastly, you know, we do realize this is an audio podcast, and so uh, this is a very visual subject matter. So, but Renee and I did record some video supplements, and so you know, we, we may um, drop them as the series progresses. So, so my first question for you, Renee, is uh, is a question that Mike often asks the guests. So, sort of um, tell us what is POCUS in in sort of like a Wikipedia like entry, and sort of. Tell us how it's different from like the type of ultrasound I'd order from radiology. I think you just referred to me as Mike, Chris, but that's okay. <laughs> Did I say Mike? <laughs> nah. Yeah, Stuart noticed oh. it too. <laughs> oh, I think I, we're from from henceforward in the episode we're going to call you what's his name. So what what's his name just referred to? <laughs> but as you may have as you may have noticed, uh, Matt. I'm going to get it right. Matt. Thank you. Matt and Chris. I, I've only known you for like a year or so. so. <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, now we'll call, we're just, mis- we're, we're switching around everybody's names. So you can feel free to call me P-Dub actually, or R-Dub. I could be R-Dub. R-Dub. <laughs> yeah. So um, as you may have noticed, I'm a little bit verbose and I'm also, um, I'm a serial comma abuser when I'm writing. So it's hard for me to, to lock it down briefly, but I'm going to do my best. So uh, POCUS, point of care ultrasound, it actually has many different terms and and abbreviations for it. So HHUS, handheld ultrasound, bedside ultrasound, all kinds of things. But the big picture, um, if you were to say like, what's a special sauce? What's magical about POCUS? And it's a clinician at the bedside with the patient acquiring, interpreting, and integrating slash acting on those findings, those images, all right now, real time. And so it's different than a consultative or quote unquote formal ultrasound in that uh, when I have a patient in front of me and I can't tell if it's it's a triple threat, you know, EF of 30% and COPD and a productive cough, usually we'll just shotgun everything, right? We'll treat all three of those things until we get some time to figure it out. 
So with POCUS, I can, I can look for signs of volume overload. I can look for signs of fluid in the lung. Whereas uh, for consultative or formal ultrasound, I'm going to go to, um, I almost used the name of medical records. I'm going to go to my medical record and I'm going to order. It's okay. Everybody knows that one. Uh, I'm going to order a test and a sonographer or an echocardiographer will perform that test. And a radiologist or a cardiologist will interpret that test. And depending on your hospital system, two hours to two weeks later, you'll get a report that you then will integrate back into your clinical decision making and act on. So the magic is that you're doing it right then real time face to face with the patient. Now, I know POCUS is used a lot by our emergency medicine colleagues. And so it seems like all my all my friends who are in emergency medicine, they all use ultrasound all the time. They can, they, they look at the heart, they look at the lungs, but it just really doesn't seem to have caught on with internal medicine. Uh, wh- why do you think that is? Yeah. So um, one thing I think is that we tend to be a very cognitive specialty and in, in one where we really like our studies and our outcomes and our, our analyses and all kinds of fancy things. Um, and, and we just don't have those things. So uh, as people mentioned over the course of this weekend is that really the, the toe in the water for emergency medicine was the fast examination. And that was the first time that outside of OB, cardiology and radiology, ultrasound was really getting out into the clinician's hands at the bedside. And it was pretty easy to justify in a trauma patient that was hypotensive like, sure, you know, ultrasounding them is probably better than sticking a needle in to see if you draw blood back or letting them code while they're in the donut of truth, otherwise known as a CT scanner. So that was a pretty easy argument. Um, over time, they built their they built their research up and they had a lot of enthusiastic people, kind of like our early I am POCUS people now. But I just think that we're very... Um, we really just love our data. You know, we want some high level, some controlled randomized trials and some meta analyses and things. And so I think that's one thing that stymied our progress, but we're working on that now. We're working on more of these, these studies. And I, I think I'll mention a couple later. There's, I think there's been more uptake in, in medical schools and residency programs. It's probably not completely ubiquitous yet, but do you think that's going to be coming and, and how long do you think it's going to take? Yeah. I mean, when you go to a meeting uh, like AIUM as American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine or another organization as SUSME, which is Society for Ultrasound and Medical Education, uh, when you go to these meetings uh, there, you obviously have your early adapters there and your people that the drink, the Kool-Aid. And earlier I tried to think of a non-brand name for Kool-Aid and I was like high fructose corn syrup colored thing. <laughs> so I'm just going to say Kool-Aid. You're going to have to deal with it. That's okay. Uh, but, but those of us who drank the Kool-Aid are there and we're ready to rock. And Sesame was actually created, interestingly, by two internists 10 years ago. And they had gone, so it's uh, Dr. Richard Hotman and Dr. Jeanette Moldenovic, who was my previous provost. They had gone to a really big high roller internal medicine conference and tried to convince their peers, you know, deans and other important people, like, look, this is the way of the future focus, man. This is where it's going to be. And they were all just like, that's insane. Like the, the stethoscope is all that we'd ever need. And so what they did was they created Sesame because it was easier to target students. No one can get mad at you for using a 3D visuospatial anatomy to tie it back in or to show the heart and say, here's the heart valves. Don't just memorize S1, S2. Look at it. People can't get that defensive about that. And so that was how they started it. And then it's just really, really grown. So if you were to ask me... Um, I want to say the quote was that 71% of medical schools right now have some component of education. Uh, I think that it's probably a hundred percent and they just didn't get everybody, you know, some people didn't know what's going on um, in residency programs as well. It's basically, it's ubiquitous. It will be out there. It's a standard of care for procedures and pretty soon it'll be the standard of care to augment our physical exam and everything else. Well, not pretty soon. I lied. I hope soon, but few years so th- this isn't in the script, but how, how much do these POCUS, the, the small machines, cost? Like, wh- what are we talking about? Because medical students, they can maybe drop $200 for a stethoscope, but how much is the, this POCUS ultrasound probe costing? 
It's a really excellent question. And it's something also that's um, contributing to our adoption or the increased adoption. They started off as these giant machines that were crazy heavy that you had to push around the emergency room or could really only live in a diagnostic sonography lab. So as they get smaller and less expensive, they were more accessible. And as you may or may not know, us internists don't exactly crank out a lot of cash flow and billing. So um, being able to being able to afford to say like fifty thousand dollar machine when you you know we, we don't it it just it wasn't doable. But back to those handheld, so they're anywhere from there's a new one that's going to be dropping or it's been announced, but it's not shipping. It's not in prod yet. Uh, that they're they're advertising for under two thousand dollars, which probably means one thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, but under two k. Um, and then that ranges up to like five or 10 K for the handheld, but there's a lot of competitive pressure. Now there's a company in Silicon Valley working on a wireless probe that will be Wi-Fi to phone in addition to the ones that plug into the iPhone. So pretty soon everyone will have one. And then the people that were fighting it will uh, feel left out and then they'll, they'll come say, Hey, you want to teach us too? That's what I hope. So bridging on a little bit about what, um, Stuart was talking about, about what types of devices i mean so on on twitter we had a guy alex moraz had he he said the same thing so what what is the best device out there he's he's asking and then he then, then he also asked like how many hours of training would be needed to be proficient in such a device and not mess it up first of all not messing it up the nice thing is that this is non-ionizing so we're not we're not irradiating patients as we do it uh we are it's generally painless i have plenty of patient satisfaction surveys and data that I've pulled from ER literature that was from the the talk I initially um, first gave at ACP, Chris. Um, but there's it's very low risk in general. So then I think his question is probably, how many hours do I have to spend before I make a call that might be wrong and then I do the wrong thing for my patient, not like, you know, mess up with the machine itself. So we don't have any uh, competency assessment is kind of, I would say, the holy grail of POCUS, and, and we're not there yet. In internal medicine, we actually have zero training guidelines, although Society of Hospital Medicine is actually working on um, a, a – they're working on a guideline-based piece to go out in JHM. But overall, internal medicine as a whole, we have no data, no recommendations, nothing. So what we do is we extrapolate from emergency medicine literature and ASAP, American College of Emergency Physicians, ever since 2001, they've been coming out with these different guidelines. And I mentioned this at the end of the Oregon course, Chris, is that so for them, they've now integrated into their residency programs, which we obviously have not fully with IM. Uh, so there's a residency based, path, based pathway. And then for us in um, faculty people, there's a practice based pathway. And so in that it might be a certain number of like, let's just, I'm throwing it out cause I don't have it in front of me, but 30 hours of, of mater- of training, whether that's hands-on or didactic, at least 50% hands-on and then a certain number of scans. So sorry, I'm going down into the weeds because there's so many questions. It's so easy to get into the weeds, but, um, big picture, I think longitudinal training is, is the most important thing. And that's really outside of hours anyway. So I should have just said, that's a tough question, my friend, and I will answer it, uh, in person. I think a natural follow-up question is where, where did you start with ultrasound and, and how long was it before you felt it was helping your practice rather than you were still just really learning and scrapping to, to get by? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So, I would say, so I got the POCUS bug. I, I got a really hardcore at the end of my residency. So one of my friends who's now an IP uh, interventional poem attending out in Boston. So he, he overnight diagnosed this pericardial fusion right before he was going home, this pericardial fusion by himself that completely changed the management for this patient. And I thought that is baller. I want to be able to do that. Like, why can't I do that? And so, but I was heading back to Oregon. So I'm leaving, I'm leaving Boston. I'm heading back to Oregon. So I crashed a couple things right at the end. Um, but I just started, there's so much foam ed stuff out there. There's so many incredible 
videos and podcasts and, and awesome, awesome resources that I'll give you for the show notes, but there's so much out there. And then I would just practice. I would tell my patients like, look, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm just trying to like scan and find that thing that they saw on your echo. Cause in the hospital, we have so much pathology. So my patient has a CT scan with an ammonia or a x-ray with an effusion. I'm just going to go see what it looks like. And I'm just going to keep practicing, practicing, practicing. And so over time in the beginning, it was just for, it was just for funsies, right? I was just learning. And then one night I had a 2 a.m. transfer from an outpatient or outside hospital who it was called a pneumonia. And he comes to me, he's had three liters of fluids, some antibiotics, and they, uh, he's still tachycardic. He's tachypnic. He hasn't seen a doctor in 20 years, terrible historian. He is soft blood pressure. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I'm just going to scan him for, I'm just going to scan him and see what I see. And I see this big, I'm not, again, I won't go into super ultrasound detail, but I see (laughs) at Cashlac, exactly at Cashlac. So this was right when I first moved to, to the Cashlac Oregon branch (laughs) (laughs) and he ended up, he had these findings that were so different than what I thought he would have. So I thought he had pneumonia and I'm like, I think this dude has like a blown or I think that he has a PE or something. So I run down to the ER and I'm like, Hey guys, can you just look at this with me? And they agreed with what I thought. And so I sent him for a CT and at 4am we figured out he actually had, it was a malignancy that was called an ammonia and bilateral PEs. And so that was what some of us, uh, Gordy Johnson, one of my colleagues here in Portland will call the the first kiss story (laughs) where you're like, I I was good enough. I did it and I figured it out. And so anyway, what I tell people that are worried about people that are worried about scanning and not knowing and and making a decision off of it, it's like, you're a doctor, right? You have your pretest probability. You have what you're working differential diagnosis. If you do a scan and you're like, oh my gosh, what that just changes everything. Phone a friend. You know, I'm like, you can call me, you can, uh, you know, put it, take a picture in, in the electronic medical app record app on your phone. I'm trying not to say the name of it. Uh, You can take it to the ER like I did. So anyway, um, early on, you're going to have to practice. You got to get reps to get good at it. So just keep getting the reps. And if you see something that changes what you're thinking, just phone a friend. And that's the only way you'll get practice. Which is kind of like how we learn most of what we do in medicine. Like, you know, we're, we're tinkering around with the EHR and we figure some stuff Mm -hmm. out, but then we ask other people and we, yeah, just like, I mean, medication, dosing and all that stuff. It's all kind of, you got to get it. You got to get in there and do it to get a feel for it, basically. Yeah. Okay. Just don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of the machine. And and you mentioned phoning you. Now, I always give the guest personal cell phone number at the end of yes, every perfect. show. So that, okay. Perfect. Just, just want to make yeah. sure we had your permission for that. <laughs> they can tweet me though. They can absolutely, they can yeah. absolutely tweet me. <laughs> okay. That's a good compromise. They could, and then they could even upload uh, whatever they're seeing and, and then you could really, really get them some information. Once you strip, strip the identifiers. Don't, don't yeah. forget to do that. Strip. Yes. You have to do it in a HIPAA compliant fashion. Yep. Okay, Renee. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a case and I want you to walk me through how would you use this case? All right. So you're at Kashik Memorial and you, you have a 64 year old man, history of severe aortic stenosis, status post recent TAVR and a course compl- complicated by uh, pneumonia and pyema require, requiring decortication. And, uh, he's got chronic diastolic heart failure and he presents the ED with, you know, dyspnea, sort of generalized fatigue and presyncope. And you find that he's got lactic acidosis, acute hepatitis, and acute renal failure. What are you going to do with this guy? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to be really, really nervous now. So uh, let's say that this is a, 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 a learner patient, a resident patient. And so um, I love to – I don't go bla- you know, go in guns blazing with my pocus, pull it out of my holster, and, and go right to it. You know, we, I want everybody, I always examine my patients in the the traditional manner first, right? So I'm going to auscultate. I can't ultrasound wheezes. And I also, there are certain um, murmurs that I might not pick up if I'm trying to see it on ultrasound, if I don't have my Doppler box in the right place, et cetera. So don't worry, people. I'm not going to tell you to throw away your stethoscope. You're, you're safe. You're safe from that. But after the learners have, after the learners or I have done my exam, that point in time, I'm going to stop and say, okay, what are my questions and what am I trying to figure out here? So in this page, this, this patient down in the cash lack memorial ED obs unit, the residents note that, you know, he, he has a 
a large neck, shocker, body habitus is precluding them feeling confident about his JVP, but they think it's elevated. His edema is much worse, protuberant abdomen, and he has kind of reduced breast sounds at both, both bases. So in this case, they are feeling very confident. We see a lot of advanced heart failure at OHSU, including LVADs and milrinone drips and all kinds of stuff. They're convinced. This is cardiogenic edema in the setting of this recent TAVR, uh, and they want a diuresim, and that's what they think. This is this is um, congestive hepatopathy and cardiorenal syndrome. And so in this setting, it's perfect. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the heart. So uh, later on, we might show a clue video or post that for you all. So that's just one protocol for systematically assessing the cardiopulmonary sy- syndrome or syndrome system. Uh, created by Dr. Kimura, who's an awesome cardiologist and POCUS teacher. So in that setting, we're going to look very briefly, we can do this super fast. So we're going to look at LV function, grossly normal or abnormal. Move along. This guy's his, they were also worried. Did he have a cardiac event post TAVR? So we, you know, his EF hasn't suddenly dropped to like 10% or something. That's very easy to say. And then we move along and we're looking for fluid in the lungs and we're not seeing any signs of, of pulmonary edema. He has the known left-sided pleural effusion, nothing crazy on the right. And then we get down into the abdomen and he has some ascite, like small ascites, which is, is new to him. But his IVC, despite having a very large abdomen, his IVC is, is collapsed. And then I say, okay, so tell me again, where did you think his JVP was? And they kind of point up at the ear and he has, you know, the prominent carotid. And then we throw on, so we put on the ultrasound and we're looking for it's very easy to see the carotid and the, ex- the internal jugular right next to it. So we put it on and we slide down his neck and at 45 degrees, he's at 45 degrees, we can barely see, if at all, the, the ec- I keep wanting to say external, the internal jugular. So at 45 degrees, right, you know, seeing it at the clavicle, our CVP is not elevated. So in this case, um, we ended up doing the residents had initially wanted to diurese. And I don't, I don't actually like to override residents. I believe very much in experiential learning in the one setting that I think it might harm the patient. So uh, in this case had recommended to go ahead and uh, give fluids and, and he actually ended up doing very well. You, you mentioned the IVC thing. I've, I've heard this IVC collapsibility, IVC di- diameter. Is that, is that something that, that we should be like reliably using, we can reliably use like POCUS for? Well, there's all kinds of caveats. So positive pressure ventilation kind of throws it out the window. Um, people used to think that it could be like this perfect manometer. Uh, if your IVC is less than two centimeters, but collapses by more than all these things, really how I think of it is in the extremes. So if it is greater than two centimeters and not collapsing at all, that should correlate with a right atrial pressure of over 15. If it is flat and and we're not really seeing it, or it's, you know, it's completely collapsing, that should correlate with a right atrial pressure under five. Everything else in between, I don't really care about. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not about volume. It's not about volume responsiveness. Will they respond to fluids? It's more, and my little guy with an EF of 30% who is here with, sepsis of urinary source, can he tolerate more fluids? Mm -hmm. And then I might give him 500 cc's and check it again. And you, and you, you mentioned, so the right atrial pressure normal is around five, if I'm remembering correctly. I don't know the exact numbers, but feel free to correct. Yeah, like five to 10. Five to 10. No, no, no. Five, five to 10. Yeah. Okay. So five to 10 is normal. So you're saying you, you're the extremes less than five or 15 is, you know, that's an extreme and you can do something with that information. And that's what we're, we're thinking of, you know, for the same as like our, our central venous pressure, we're kind of using all these. So one of the problems is that all the studies are really variable if what they use for their gold standard. So I'm not even, we don't even have to go down like the, the CVP rabbit hole. And I'm probably, you know, some cardiologists are probably going to listen to this and be like, God, she's such an idiot. It's totally like six to nine or like, what is she even talking about? I guess my major take home point from this is that we're trying to find the extremes. Yeah. Is my patient grossly, do they have grossly elevated right atrial or central venous pressures or are they hypovolemic and have it low? And in this patient, which, and of course, um, 
uh, I should say, like, I don't want it to sound like the OHSU IM residents, like our ter- the, the OHSU IM residents are excellent. Let's say that this was emergency medicine residents. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. This is just the learners, the no, student. I, I don't always, think it comes off that always you're blame the student. No, I mean, I, I think it, it comes off. It, it's a situation I find myself in, uh, relatively commonly where you're, you got kind of, you're like, based on the story and the exam, it's not yeah. quite obvious if the patient's dry or they're really wet because of their habitus and their multiple comorbidities. So I think, you know, it doesn't make your residents look bad at all. What I did want to ask just as a clarif- clarifying statement, uh, back to your story, kind of your own journey into POCUS, you mentioned you were like mm-hmm. kind of playing around using the ultrasound as much as you could. Was this like the wheeled ultrasound with the multiple probes that they commonly keep in the ER, or the ICU, or had you like purchased your own and you're like, I'm just going to go out there buy my own ultrasound. So how, if someone wants to follow you on that kind of journey, uh, what, yeah. and, and this patient you were just talking about, what were you using? Yeah. I wish that I had my own handheld ultrasound. I mentioned in the one liner that my husband is very tolerant of my work obsessions, but I have not yet been able to fold a handheld ultrasound into my remodeling budget. So that's failed, but we, because I happen to direct point of care ultrasound across the university, which is a part of simulation. And they had just purchased, um, back when I came back, uh, you know, to cash Lack Memorial Oregon branch, of course, um, they had just purchased a bunch of ultrasound machines. And so I made the strong argument that, that practicing on a patient with a BMI or a model, a med student, a pre-med student with a BMI of 20 will never translate into image acquisition skills on our real patients. Therefore, we cannot only teach in the simulation center. So we kind of sprinkled some education, a few education units around the hospital. Wonderful. I like that. Education units. Yeah, that's a good I, idea. I need to convince yeah. my hospital to purchase some education units. Yeah. And these are, uh, are these handheld okay. devices that we're talking about? Or are these the ones on wheels? Like with the, you know, it has, it has the wheels at the bottom and it goes up and it has the big uh-huh. that you fold open and the multiple pr- exactly. probes. Okay. Exactly. Got yeah. It. So these, these are the multiple probes. The problem, there's pros and cons because we're scattered across the whole hospital. So sometimes I have to admit, I probably should schlep that machine to the, the, the elevator, go downstairs a floor to, you know, 10 a at cash like or whatever go, you know, go to the patient's room and scan them and then take it back. But, you know, there's, there's a lunch rush and it it gets, it gets long. So the handhelds are incredible for their portability and and you never have to go find it. You never have to do anything. But with residents, for instance, if you, if you don't have a great way to check it out, check it back in, know that maybe the admitting resident always has it, the night float resident, they can get misplaced. And so that's, just yeah. something if you're going to be purchasing, there's a ton of, I, I would love to be a super connector. You could email me or, or, or tweet me and I will put you in contact with different people with different kinds of machines that can talk about pros and cons. And back to that first question, there's no perfect machine. Somebody said, what's the right machine? And there is no right machine. It's about figuring what you need to use it for. Yeah. Maybe you can just give us, I, I mean, like when I'm talking to people about like microphone or podcasting equipment, I just say like, here's like two or three microphones that I've used that I know have a good reputation or various, maybe you, we can put something like that together for the audience for the show notes, just like an en- yeah, awesome. entry level and, and, and that sort of thing. And I know you're going to give us some resources. Um, yeah. Chris, so what's, what's next here? Uh, I know, you know, we got a little bit of time left with Renee, so I want to make sure we get to the, some of the listener questions and maybe another case or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my, my next question is sort of going back to, you know, going up, seeing the patient, talking to them and, you know, you're not an ultrasonographer, but you're there like with an ultrasound probe, like, and then say if I'm a learner and I'm trying to learn how to do this, like what, what's the interaction with the patient? Like, how do you do you introduce yourself like, Hey, I'm just a doctor pretending to be an ultrasonographer or I mean, what, what do you do? <laughs> are you talking to them with that? Yeah. It's a great question because I do this. I, I, I call it trolling the wards for, for patients to scan. So I do it with students, residents, visiting faculty, everybody. So I start off and I say, I introduce myself and, you know, flatter gets you a long way. So I say, hi, you know, I'm Dr. D. I'm one of the teaching doctors here at Cash Lack Memorial. And, um, I am here because I asked, I ask my, my colleagues for nice patients who might be willing to let us practice ultrasound on them. And I say, you know, I'm not a sonographer. I'm not a radiologist or a heart doctor. This is for educational purposes. And 
uh, if we, you know, there's no radiation. And if we find anything weird that we're not expecting, we'll let your primary medical team know because this right here is, is not part of your medical care. So I just, I, um, I did research before med school. So I try to, you know, my little spiel is kind of along those lines. And the alternative is, you know, it's just completely optional. When it's my patient, it's different because I'm not just trolling the wards for nice patients to torture. And so I'll tell them, I'm going to do a focused study. This is not an echocardiogram, especially for the heart failure patients that know exactly what that is. So this is a focused study. I'm looking specifically for X, hydronephrosis, fluid in your kidney. I'm looking for Y. Um, you know, I'm not a radiologist and this doesn't look for everything comprehensively. So that way, when cardiology comes later in the day, the patient doesn't say, oh yeah, Dr. D already did an echo on me. That's the last thing I want them to say. And then have me look like an idiot that thinks I'm awesome and can do a full formal echo like a sonographer can. Yeah. So say you are the, say you're the primary team and you're seeing the patient and you're, you're pulling out the ultrasound because you're, you, you, you know, you're worried, you know, do they have, you know, that they have some sort of heart failure and that you can find some, some findings from that. Like how, how do you document that? And then are, are you billing for that? Cause that's a, a question I'm, I get, I got yeah. like multiple times on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. Like how do you document? How do you bill? Are you billing? What, what's going yes. on with that? Yeah. Yes. I had a question about that. It is an excellent question and it really truly varies. There are no standards. Emergency medicine has their standards. Uh, I really liked your interview with, with Dr. Mike Wagner um, talking about this. So the thing is that I, I ultimately believe in better patient care and uh, more, uh, you know, high value care. So I don't necessarily want to be billing these for me personally. However, if I do an ultrasound guided thoracentesis, that one, I'm using the standard of care in the way it should be used. And also somebody, something's got to pay for those machines on the wards, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that is, is one setting. But let's say I'm just doing it. I'm checking their IDC every day of an admission for heart failure. Um, what I do is I end up in, in myself and like David Tierney, who gave a couple lectures for us, Chris, we'll just put in our physical exam. Um, this isn't like the ER team saying that there's no acute cholecystitis. This is me seeing this patient every day of the hospitalization and having to save images and archive them and bill for that. I don't think that's, that's really right. So I just put in my note, I, you know, like under cardiac IVC today is still plethoric with no respiratory variation and, and move along or JVP visible, you know, with ultrasound, I had a patient with BMI of 90, but you could still see her JVP with ultrasound or I, sorry, uh, internal, internal jugular vein. So, so, so you're documenting just like you would, like if I use my stethoscope, I'm not billing for all the sounds coming on my stethoscope, but I'm sort of, you're not saying, recording them. I'm just imagining like the first guy with a stethoscope, just like it was that unique that he was like bringing around visiting professors, like to the bedside with the one wooden stethoscope or whatever. Yeah. Check it. <laughs> That's going to be the picture for this uh, episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> question I had for you. When you're doing this POCUS, are you uh, printing off images from the ultrasound and putting it into the chart or are you transmitting it to the chart at all? Uh, that's the old, so the old school ways, they only had the printers before the days of the, yeah, the Wi-Fi right. and the, before the days of the interwebs. That's right. And so they would print them and they put them in the paper chart. Nowadays, uh, one thing I'm trying to push for the entire hospital system at Cashlack Memorial is uh, we call it middleware and it works between the machines and uh, you can have it route. So there's a server, a secure server. And then the machine and it connects. And so your educational scans can all go into one educational portfolios, your other scans, you can, you can send them to the server, to PACS, to whatever. So it really depends on what you're doing. If somebody in the CVICU is making a case off of a POCUS scan for pericardial tamponade that requires the cath lab, then yeah, that image should be in PACS. It should be viewable by all, and they should write a formal note and bill on that. But that's just kind of not my general hospitalist work. I'm using it very much as a generalist, I would say. Okay. So I, I so you you mentioned earlier. I, I when I was at your course, I I, I took uh, Mike Wagner uh, um, uh, away and we started talking a little bit, and I asked him about his thoughts on um, using ultrasound as actually improving physical exam skills instead of um, 
yeah. taking away from our ability to do physical exam. And I was wondering uh, whether you had similar thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I started practicing ultrasound, it made both my, I, I believe it made my physical exam much better. In addition to my anatomical knowledge, uh, all those, all those brain cells from med school, they, they all came back. So, um, one example, so I do a lot of teaching with early MD and PA students and trying to memorize S1, S2, systole, diastole is so abstract. And they're always looking at those little tick marks on the board and getting pimped on it. But when you can show them just a very simple parasternal long axis, it's the, probably the easiest view to get. And you can show them the mitral valve closing and the aortic valve closing. And you can say, okay, watch this. Here's systole. Here's diastole. You can throw color flow on a mitral regurgitation murmur and see it going backwards into the left atrium. That's what we were hearing. Or we can say, you're right. You thought that IJ was, you know, 12 centimeters. You're totally right. Look, here's a meniscus on ultrasound. Or they say, well, I don't really know, but I think I heard some crackles or I think I heard reduced breath sounds with dullness to percussion. And then you show them the fluid and the lung doing the little, you know, jellyfish sign in there. Like, yep, that's why you you didn't hear breath sounds. Same for splenum angle, all kinds of things. So we really can, it can be very, very powerful to enhance the physical exam, but also to confirm and help teach the physical exam. Yeah. I'm I'm really wanting to get my hands on an ultrasound machine so I can start uh, yeah. start playing around here. Hey, hey, Chris, have you ever made a diagnosis using Pocus? Uh, I literally just learned how to use Pocus this weekend, but I'm yeah. so excited. Mm-hmm. So I learned how to do you know the peristyle long, peristyle short. Yeah, you know, I actually learned the clue exam this weekend, and what was really fun because um, I ordered some echoes on a patient, uh, several patients this week, and um, I. I had the echo. I looked at the report. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to look at the actual images. I pulled up the images. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can actually read these to like yeah. an amateur way. But it was just sort of fun and cool. And, you know, obviously I need to put my reps in and I got to practice and, and do that. But, you know, one of these days I'm going to get myself an ultrasound machine and I'm going to do that. And, um, yeah. I have put myself on that wait list for that, um, that, that, uh, less than $2,000 machine. So we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll get that and I'll be able to play with that a little bit. It was kind of like what, what Dr. Group, Gerpreet was saying. You, you, if you, if you keep a case log of even your ultrasound cases, that'll help to hone your accuracy. So estimate what it's, what it is before the ultrasound and then do the ultrasound and then send it for, for a formal ultrasound. So you can hone your accuracy. Um, the one case that I had, I actually had diagnosed a myosarcoma in clinic. I felt, uh, her, her calf and she had a little bump there and it, it didn't belong there. It wasn't painful. It didn't feel like a lymph node and followed the, the muscle architecture down. Now I'm, I'm not an ultrasonographer, but I could tell that what I was ultrasounding was not normal muscle ar- architecture when it, it, it was, it was cystic. It was not very nice looking. Um, but it was small and, uh, made the diagnosis before it, it had, uh, become a significant issue and got a, um, a partial t- tissue excision. Um, and it had a not use ultrasound. I don't think I would have been able to send that, um, confidently. No, that's something that we often hear in these stories, especially in the outpatient setting. Right. Um, we, we added some outpatient clinical cases to the course this year and, um, you don't, you're not going to know everything. Radiologists don't know everything. They've been, you know, somebody's been practicing for 30 years. They're still going to find things, see things that they don't know what they are, but you learn normal. And when something's not normal, it's great. Go ahead and, and get a, get a workup. My, my general medicine ultrasound fellow that just stayed on mm-hmm. for um, a primary care job has a lot of great cases of things he's, he's picked up in the clinic. So I want to make sure we're clear. This isn't just inpatient. This is outpatient. Right. I believe that every single person. I mean, if I had a goal, it'd be that no one would ever leave, you know, cash like Memorial in the, in, in its educational sites without knowing the very basics of how to work the machine and make probably five specific clinical diagnoses. So go on. So you were just talking about outpatient settings. So we have a lot of listeners who are outpatient practitioners, yeah. you know, and you know, we're, we've talked a lot about these sick, sick patients coming in and, you know, they need, they need lines. They, they have like their lungs are flooded, all these other things. Like should, so should primary care practitioners be using POCUS? I mean, what, what are ways in which you could foresee uh, me and my outpatient setting using it on a daily basis or at least a weekly basis? 
Yeah. So our general medicine ultrasound fellows, their clinical time is in the urgent care clinic within the primary care practice. So they're, they're OH or they're cash like Memorial, <laughs> um, primary care patients. And, uh, they, they, you know, when they have an issue, they're more short of breath they're more whatever. So that, that same volume assessment that you do as an inpatient is huge as an outpatient musculoskeletal stuff. So one of the, the most common complaints, musculoskeletal stuff, granted musculoskeletal focus is a little bit more complex, but very simple knee effusion, Achilles rupture. I could never, you could never have seen an ultrasound image and I would bet you that 99% out of 100 physicians could say which one the rupture is. So, you know, there's, there's all these <laughs> great 1%. things. <laughs> and then one study, yeah, those people are hopeless, really. <laughs> um, so in, we don't have a ton of outcome data, but they're with B lines, which are signs of increased interstitial density in the right setting, pulmonary edema, but in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis could be pulmonary fibrosis. But um, we have some outcome study for discharge from hospital, but also prognosis uh, from uh, ambulatory clinic visits. And so if patients had more, greater or equal to three B lines in more than two lung fields, they actually had increased hospital admissions and increased mortality at six months. I'll give you that for the show notes as well. But that's one of the coolest ones because we're finally starting to get some outcomes data. So if their lungs are wet, when you're seeing them in clinic, it's not just a minor detail. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned there would be five things that you'd want everybody graduate because because I think we're coming to the end of your time here. So I wanted to ask, yeah. what are the five things that you want all the Cashlack Memorial, you know, graduating residents and, and medical students to know? What, what would be the five, like top five POCUS exam findings? It's a great one. Okay, so you're putting me on the spot here. I'm ready though. Okay. So no one should ever die of pericardial tamponade in the world ever. This should never happen. And we still get people transferred to cash lack from outside hospitals where they're coding maybe a young kid on immunosuppressive for Crohn's and, and they've coded and then they get resuscitated. And somebody says, this ain't sepsis throws a probe on huge pericardial fusion. That should never happen. Uh, I believe free abdominal fluid is, is something that everyone should be able to rule out. I'm a nerd. And I like to call it the fast exam for internal medicine is in the fluid assessment sans trauma. <laughs> there you go. Um, so then uh, hydronephrosis and the, I guess genitourinary because my uh, some other time over, over a beer, I, I will tell people, uh, I'll tell you a story about my father-in-law and an acute kidney injury because of, of hydronephrosis that wasn't caught. Um, and so we talked about free food in the abdomen, hydronephrosis, the, the pericardial effusions, just grossly reduced ejection fraction. And um, I'm going to go with the lungs. How about just the lungs? No, no. Um, plural effusions. How about that? Uh, there's too many things I love. I'm sorry. It's too hard. It's too hard. <laughs> okay. So so you're that's good, though. That That is... Uh... So there's probably probably a top ten would have been easier for you, but I I like it. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> well, how about something a little easier then? How about what are your main take home points for our listeners before we we sign off today? Perfect. So I think take home point number one is that it's not it's not scary. The ultrasound machine isn't scary just because you've maybe only used it for procedures or oh, thank goodness. if you're <laughs> if you're a little later in your career, it's don't be afraid of it. You can't hurt the patient with it. You can't hurt them by practicing if you tell them. You can them. hit them with it. <laughs> you can. Okay, fine. I lied. You can hurt them with it. You can. But um, the ultrasound machine, by it's not it's not as intimidating as you make it out to be. So so stop fearing the machine. Uh, I think that there is an incredible amount that we can add to our clinical care with patients as we incorporate it into our practice. And um, if you don't practice it, you will lose it. So there's a lot of skill attrition studies. And so once you learn it, you got to keep practicing it as well. I'm, I'm sold. I'm going to, I'm going to try to get Yay. myself to a course uh, sometime soon so that, cause I know 
the residency program that I'm working at right now, the the cash lack version of cash lack that I'm working at right now, uh, I think could use could use some of this. And I, I've I was talking as I was kind of prepping for the episode, I've been talking to some people and everyone seems excited about it. I mean, everyone's certainly at the very least intrigued by it. And hopefully this this episode will start to make people more excited and convince them that it can help our teaching. It can help our exam findings. Maybe, maybe even the patients like it. I don't know. Maybe it'll improve our the patient patients relationships. Love it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> another time. Sorry. I clearly, I'm a talker. Okay. I'm a talker, <laughs> but another time I will tell you all about, uh, the, the patients love it. They are so excited to get to see their innards and they just, they love it. Little old men, their favorite joke is, is it a boy or a girl? <laughs> <laughs> it's their favorite, so. Nice. I think that's a perfect ending. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to plug before you leave us? No, just um, you know, a lot of us, the I am Pocus crew. So if you're on Twitter, hashtag I am Pocus is where we try to tag courses, tweets that you know, clips, things that are relevant to us. Because for many years, I just was following around. I love my EM and, and crit care people, but it's so exciting to have a group of I am Pocus nerds together. We're trying to push. We're pushing SHM. We're pushing ACP. We're pushing SGM. We are really out there you know, really working hard to get what we believe to be this incredible tool out there to the masses. So, um, we're just, we're really excited and I'm, I just am honored to be on the show. I'm kind of like a groupie fan. Like I love, I love your, I love your show so much. So. Well, thank you so much for saying that. I'm, I'm a huge fan of yours now that I've met you and, uh, I, yeah, I enjoyed the sense of humor and, and your passion about this topic. Yeah, and this was without caffeine. I haven't had caffeine in hours. Excellent. Okay. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. You can get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and join our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food, and you'll get a weekly copy of our wonderfully done show notes. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. You can reach us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. You know, we haven't had a lot of reviews on iTunes lately. They've slowed down a lot. We're at like 540. All right, come on, people. Or on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter, at The Curbsiders. Until next time, I've been Dr. Mike. No, wait. Matt Watto. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you changed it there, Stuart, so I figured I'd, I'd, I'd bite. No, no, I'm, I'm Paul. <laughs> And I'm Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham, here with... And, I, and I'm Christopher Chu and not Pauline. <laughs> and thanks to Chris, the Chu Man, for producing this episode and going all the way out to Oregon to, uh, to video uh, segments on this episode. Our, our Twitter account is run by Hannah R. Abrams. Beth Garbs Garbatelli is on Instagram. And of course, Chris, the Chu Man Chu, is still on Facebook. Thank you and good night. Did you replace all the bats with bikes? <laughs> yes, <I did. laughs> uh,